Um, so Daniel sort of teed me up nicely, mentioning my tweet on Leonard Peltier. That's the, the case that I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight. So I have a feeling that this room is probably already pretty familiar with the case, but if you have sort of a general grasp of background, can you raise your hand just so I sort of... Okay, excellent. So I won't <laughs> go over a ton of it. I'll just give you sort of broad strokes. I'm yes, really please. sorry, but I no, need no. to say this. Please do. Nothing makes my blood boil more than the thought of these officials daring to fix their mouth to call Leonard Peltier, an indigenous person of this country, a murderer when it is Leonard's people, indigenous people in this country that were slaughtered into virtual extinction. And they dare to fix their mouth to call him a murderer. I don't care what happened on the Pine Ridge Reservation. I don't care. Doesn't matter. They can fix their mouth to call him a murderer. I can't take it. <laughs> and you can speak, and I will watch and clap, and we'll be good. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know about Leonard, that's okay. I think most folks in the room do. But broad strokes, right? Leonard Peltier is a 71-year-old who has been incarcerated for more than four decades. That anniversary was marked earlier this year for a crime that there is no available evidence that he committed. That is a fact that the US government no longer disputes. They say there is no available evidence that you committed this crime. And yet, all of his available legal, legal remedies have been exhausted. He's lost at multiple appeal hearings, and he's repeatedly been denied parole based on the fact that he will not admit culpability for a crime for which there is no available evidence that he committed. Now, you alluded a bit to the crime that he is in prison for. Uh, two FBI agents were killed at Pine Ridge Reservation, which spans the Dakotas, in 1975. Now, at that time, right, he was a member, a leading member of the American Indian Movement, which came to prominence at the same time as the Panthers, and was waging the same basic struggle for the survival of a people that the Panthers were waging. In the lead up to the firefight, on Pine Ridge, at which Leonard was killed, the FBI was already gearing up for a major confrontation with AIM activists on Pine Ridge. At that point, they had already marched to Washington, D.C. and occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they had occupied a Wounded Knee in recognition of the tragedy that was committed there previously. And so I'm sure that many of you have seen the COINTEL list of extremist organizations and troublemakers, or actually rabble-rousers, as they were called at that time by COINTELPRO and the FBI. AIM activists were on that list, including Leonard Peltier. And in the lead up to this shootout, an estimated 65 plus people had been killed or disappeared by paramilitary squads, allegedly connected to the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs government. Now, there's no way to actually tangibly connect the funding for these paramilitaries to BIA because at that time, the federal government was giving the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the local tribal leadership money for highway grants. There was absolutely no documentation about how that money was being spent, and they were allegedly, right, probably using that money to set up paramilitary organizations that reported directly to BIA leadership. And so when two FBI officers pursued an unnamed suspect onto Pine Ridge Reservation, AIM leaders thought that they were about to be killed, which was a, a reasonable thing to think given the number of people who had been killed in the previous years. And so gunfire was exchanged. Three people died that day. Two FBI agents, whose names have been repeated, and a native person, whose name is never repeated, and there's never been any justice for his case. However, two people were prosecuted for killing the FBI agents. Both people were acquitted based on the fact that the jury thought that they could reasonably believe that their lives were at risk given the climate of terror and fear on the reservation. 
When that happened, Leonard Peltier was extradited from Canada, where he had fled because he feared for his life and for his inability to access justice in this country, based on affidavits that the FBI later admitted they knew were perjured. And the woman, Myrtle Poorbear, who gave those affidavits, said that she did it only after she had been followed and harassed for months by FBI agents. And this was a woman whose mental health was also unstable and who struggled with substance abuse. And so again, we see a pattern in this case, right, of the law enforcement officers preying on the most vulnerable people over and over again to pursue their version of justice, despite the fact that there was no available evidence that Leonard Peltier had committed this crime. Over the course of the trial, there were multiple additional miscarriages of justice. The two other key eyewitnesses for the FBI later said that they were pressured into testifying and recanted. Potentially exculpatory evidence, ballistics evidence specifically, that showed that the gun used to kill the FBI agents could not have been Leonard Peltier's was suppressed. All of these issues coming together, right, around this four decade miscarriage of injustice, illuminate a system in which it was completely improbable and impossible for this person to access the equal justice under law that's promised on the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, despite the fact that he was repeatedly rejected at appeal hearings, that he repeatedly lost, one of the judges who presided over a later appeal hearing, Judge Heaney, wrote a letter eventually saying that he thought that the issues surrounding this trial were so troubling that they merited consideration for leniency later in the case, specifically parole, right? That's what he's talking about here. However, because Leonard will not admit that he killed FBI agents, the parole board has repeatedly denied him, despite also saying, we recognize that there's no available evidence that you did this. So now we're at a point in this moment where Leonard is 71 years old. He is incarcerated at USP Coleman, the max in USP Coleman specifically, thousands of miles from his friends and his family. He's very sick. He has an abdominal aortic aneurysm, which if treated, can be managed relatively easily, but if it ruptures, there is a 90% chance of mortality. And the Bureau of Prisons has still told us, well, we're waiting to see how big it is before we operate again. This despite the fact that a 71-year-old man is in a maximum security prison where he could at any moment, right, by a guard or another inmate, be in a physical altercation which could cause it to rupture. When I visited him last, he said, Jasmine, listen, the prison guards and the medical staff, they walk when there's an emergency. If this ruptures, I'm going to die on the stretcher, leaving the prison for the prison hospital. I'm not going to make it. Right now, this is just a bit of medical background. We know that when it was first found, the AAA abdominal aortic aneurysm was at five, inch, five centimeters by 4.5 centimeters. <coughs> They gave him another MRI about a month ago, and they still haven't released the results to Leonard, to his lawyers, or to any of the advocates working on his behalf. And so we have no way of knowing how grave his risk is right now, but every time I talk to him, he's afraid he's going to die. Now that's a, a pretty grave portrait of why things are so bad right now, right? But I think that this is also a moment in which we have an opportunity. Unfortunately, as Leonard's health is failing, we're also coming to the end of President Obama's time in office, which means we're coming to the moment where if he is going to grant executive clemencies, it's going to be between now and January 20th. Now, there has been a much needed and long overdue movement toward criminal justice reform, which has been championed in various ways by both sides of the aisle, right? And, and with that, we've seen more clemencies, more commutations and pardons than the previous seven presidents combined. However, this has a relatively narrow purview, which is an important purview, but defines Leonard out of that class of people that the president has committed to addressing. Because of Clemency Project 2014 and the commitment to address nonviolent drug offenders, President Obama is looking very hard at those cases. 
Now that process, as I'm sure many of you know, is frankly a disaster and has been so under-resourced and underfunded that the previous pardons attorney quit saying that you know, there wasn't enough resources, that there were going to be thousands of cases that were meritorious, that were simply never going to be looked at. And even today when we look at the clemency process and who is getting writs of clemency, there's no sense of where these are coming from or who the political influencers are that are ultimately moving these cases. And so this to me brings a larger question into relief as well. Right, when we think about nonviolent drug offenses, it's incredibly important to place that in the context of the war on drugs and the way that that has put mass incarceration in this country into overdrive. Mm -hmm. However, there's also, I think, a question of what violence means when you're prosecuting people in the US criminal justice system. What does it mean that Leonard Paltier was convicted of a violent crime when he was convicted in a moment where the violence surrounding his community and the communities of Native people across the United States was so pervasive that people were literally struggling for their lives every day. Beyond that, when we look at sentencing practices in this country, we know that people are charged as violent offenders if the police come and there's a gun in the same room as cocaine, right? That's insane. That's insane. And so when we're looking at this case, calling for Leonard Peltier to be granted clemency, we also need to be asking for a more comprehensive look at what criminal justice reform means so that we're not saying, oh yes, we're doing great. This country has decarcerated a ton of people. The people who are still inside, they can be left there because they're the bad ones. They're the violent ones. We need to be pushing for more and calling for more. And Leonard's case is emblematic of the need to look beyond these narrow purviews purview of reform and say, okay, we'll, we'll compromise on getting rid of mandatory minimums, we're good on that, let's increase the max and let's really go after kingpins and violent offenders. Um, and then the other thing that this really calls into relief for me, right, again, is the intersection between the struggle for environmental justice and the struggle for political prisoners and for criminal justice reform in this country. Uh, and to illuminate that, I'm going to tell you one of my, my personal favorite recent stories about Leonard. So my good friend, who I'm sure many of you know, she's an earth firster and a fantastic kick-ass lawyer and organizer, Emily Posner, reached, woo, Emily, <laughs> reached out to Leonard because she was looking at Letcher Prison and trying to figure out you know, who are the people who could potentially be transferred to Letcher that we can get to tell their stories. And so she reached out to Leonard and Leonard said, I'm very interested in helping you with your issue and it's definitely something that affects me, but I also need you to be my lawyer and act on my behalf. <laughs> And, and I was talking on the phone to her and I was like, Emily, you're a hell of an organizer, but you just got out organized. That's, that's what just happened. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, what that sort of illuminates for me, right, is that the people who are in jails and prisons in the United States are not only the people who are going to bear the highest cost of environmental injustice, degradation, of horrible projects like the Letcher Prison, but they're also the people with the most to offer. I mean, you can, you can look at this panel and say, I would say people who have been inside are the best organizers and the best lawyers that I know, hands down, amazing. And so when we think about that, you know, this is, this is a struggle with which the voices of the people who have the most at stake need to be constantly elevated. And the voices of the people who have the most at stake need to be free to speak, which means that people like Leonard Peltier, who can talk about the very foundations of the intersections between native rights, environmental rights, and criminal justice, and unequal protection of law, need to be out from behind prison bars, because those are the people who should be leading our movements. Mm -hmm.